Welcome to today's video. I'm Richard Chapo, an internet lawyer in San Diego. Uh, today we're discussing the case of South Dakota versus Wayfair Inc. This is an important uh, decision on a rather bland topic. Uh, it discusses the Supreme Court decision in June 2018 uh, on the question of whether states can charge online out-of-state retailers uh, sales tax for sales. Uh, so just to be clear, we're talking about a situation where, uh, let's say that you are located in California and you have a small e-commerce store and you make uh, 10 sales into South Dakota during the year. Are you required to collect sales tax for those uh, transactions and then submit that to uh, South Dakota? may not sound like all that difficult of a process or interesting of a question, but for small businesses, um, you know, you're facing a situation where you have all the different states that have all different rules and what have you on sales tax, different rates, how they're calculated, what's included, what's not. Uh, and once you start thinking about it that way, it becomes very complex and very burdensome. Uh, and so there has been a rather subtle uh, war going on between states and online retailers over the last 20 years on this issue. Uh, so South Dakota, like many states, taxes the retail sales of goods and services in the state. Sellers are required to collect and remit uh, the tax to the state. Um, but if they don't, then you, consumers are supposed to report and file um, their own tax report. And this is called a use tax. Uh, you've probably never heard of it, and that's because nobody does it. Um, compliance rates are hilariously low. I mean, literally, some businesses do it, and that's about it. Uh, so the end result is states are losing out on quite a bit of revenue. So in the case of South Dakota, the revenue estimates were around $59 million. Uh, that may not sound like a huge figure, but keep in mind South Dakota has a very small population. If you were to translate that question into California or New York or another state that has a large population, you can see how those numbers would grow quickly and um, companies or states would be facing pretty significant shortfalls. So um, the question is, how do states deal with that? And in, in South Dakota, the legislature enacted a law uh, requiring out-of-state sellers to collect and remit sales tax as if the seller had a physical presence in the state. Uh, the new law uh, covered only sellers that on an annual basis delivered more than $100,000 of goods or services into the state or engaged in 200 or more separate transactions for the delivery of goods or services into the state. So what we have here is uh, South Dakota trying to set a threshold uh, where they are focusing on larger companies and uh, letting smaller companies uh, go. Now, there's going to be a reason for that. Uh, and that reason is found in a case called Quill. So Quill was a company that uh, in the 1990s was uh, delivering catalogs to states. So remember, we're talking you know 1992-ish uh, when the Quill decision came out. And this is pre-internet. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to buy something, you were forced to go down to the local store or the local mall and you had limited, uh, recover, you know, limited options. And it was, you know, it was, it was hell on earth. It was just miserable, miserable, miserable. You couldn't sit in front of a computer in your PJs and, uh, you know, shop for Christmas presents or what have you. Uh, brochures were kind of the uh, pre-internet internet, if you will. Uh, there were companies such as the Sears that would send out these large catalogs um, to people all over the, the country, and uh, people would make purchases, and you know, companies like Sears were doing very well with the advent of the internet. Well, uh, catalogs kind of went, uh, became passe, and you only have to look at the state of, company, of companies like Sears to understand uh, how that, that has affected uh, the uh, commerce market. So uh, with South Dakota losing you know, the, this money, you know, what were they going to do? Um, in Quill, the court looked at the catalog situation and said, as long, essentially, as long as you don't have any physical uh, presence in a state, such as an office, uh, drop shipping location, uh, employees, things of that sort, then states are not going to be allowed to collect sales tax from you because it's too much of a burden on uh, commerce. And that was the decision pretty much going forward. And what happened then was states would get into these these funny little games where they would try to claim, oh, well, if you have an affiliate, an affiliate is essentially an employee and that creates enough of a physical nexus that you have to uh, pay taxes uh, in our state. And then state, the larger internet companies would respond, particularly Amazon, by axing all their affiliates. And uh, so that got ugly quickly. And it was a good result really for no one.
so in looking at Quill, uh, the Supreme Court did what the Supreme Court does, uh, which is recognize that society has changed and that perhaps a new test is required. In fact, the Supreme Court and Justice Kennedy, who wrote the decision, were pretty clear on this. And he wrote, uh, when the day-to-day functions of marketing and distribution in the modern economy are considered, it becomes evident that Quill's physical presence rules are artificial in its entirety. Modern e-commerce does not align analytically with a test that relies on the sort of physical presence defined in Quill. And the court should not maintain a rule that ignores substantial virtual connections to the state. So that's pretty dead on and pretty much takes Quill out to the, uh, you know, the farm up north where uh, your mom and dad told you your puppy went. Uh, Quill is pretty much dead on arrival now as a law, as case law. And any cases that were decided using Quill as authority also are now uh, in serious jeopardy. It's not really surprising. I think if you look at society and you see the fact that the internet has just revolutionized pretty much every uh, area of business, um, you know, it isn't really hard to see that we needed a new test. However, you're probably grinding your teeth at this point because you're thinking, how am I going to comply with, uh, you know, these, these sales tax rules and laws and different rates and everything else for every state? That's a huge burden. You know, I'm a one or two person shop and, you know, I'm going to spend all my time dealing with sales tax issues. And you're right. Um, this was presented to the court and argued rather vehemently by uh, the individuals involved in the appeal on behalf of Wayfair, as well as independent parties who submitted briefs. And the court's response is kind of interesting. They admit that there would be a burden on small businesses, but they look at this case and they say, South Dakota set these thresholds, the $100,000 in sales or the 200 transaction thresholds. So for smaller companies that only have you know, 500 sales, or 500 sales, you know, 50 sales or something of that sort into the state, you know, there isn't a burden because it's clear that you do not need to comply. So this raises some interesting questions. Okay, well, is that 100,000, 200 transaction now the standard? Um, Because, uh, you know, if you look at a state like California or maybe New York, you know, those are very low thresholds. Through a year, you know, if you're doing any substantial amount of business, you may easily hit 200 transactions in California uh, or $100,000 in total sale revenues in, in New York or someplace of that sort. Uh, and what you're going to see now is the states running around and trying to set their own thresholds. And there are going to be states such as California, where I am, that are going to try to push that number down uh, because they want as much money as they can get. And so we're going to have years and years and years of more litigation now about what is a viable threshold. You know, when is it too burdensome on small businesses and when is it not? And unfortunately that's just kind of where things stand there. Now the Supreme court also says something else interesting, which was um, they said, as far as the complexity of dealing with all these different States, uh, you know, they expect that computer programs are going to be developed to take care of the problem. Yes, let's program, baby. Um, This is kind of an interesting concept because the court is stating that although nothing exists now, we expect capitalism to take care of the problem. And in truth, this has pretty much been the case uh, in the past. And if we look at the companies that are online, I'm sure there are entrepreneurs now who are already working on these kinds of programs. But if you think of a company like Amazon, you know, Amazon's already tracking sales. They already have an extremely sophisticated tracking system. So it isn't too hard to imagine them kicking out an independent Uh, service or an independent company um, that would deal directly with this issue. Then you have companies like QuickBooks and so on and so forth who may uh, as well get into it. Uh, So although there isn't anything now, as far as I know, I think it's reasonable to expect that we are going to see um, some software solutions. So as as fearful and miserable as you may be thinking things are now, I think this is probably going to end up being just more of part of your to-do list um, with your business you know, doing your books and everything else. And, you know, you may well hire an outside service just to take care of it. Um, so a lot of people have described uh, South Dakota versus Wayfair Inc. As, as, you know, this death knell for small businesses online. I don't really think it's going to be that. Uh, and if uh, states get too aggressive with setting low thresholds, I think you will see courts step in and uh, put a stop to that. Um, the, the government and, yeah, pretty much all the branches of the government have been pretty pro-internet. Uh, they seem to view it as a viable and incredibly valuable platform, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, they've usually gone to great lengths to protect it. You don't see a lot of restrictions on it. Now, you may think you do in the United States, but trust me, when you compare it to other countries, uh, the things you see going on in the EU with 
link taxes associated with copyright and, and things of that sort. You know, we live in a pretty good environment here. So if you're in the States and you're, you're selling to uh, various states, you know, you're going to have to figure out what the thresholds are for those states and whether you need to uh, collect and remit sales tax. Again, hopefully we're going to see computer programs here pretty quickly that will do it. Some states are actually already even offering their own computer programs. Um, but make sure you talk with a CPA and get a game plan in place to try to address this issue. Uh, I imagine there will be some leniency, uh, you know, at the outset as people try to figure out, you know, how to comply with all of this. Uh, but sooner or later, states are going to get aggressive with collection and uh, you want to make sure that you're not one of those targets. So that's the uh, video for today. If you have any questions or comments, you can always reach me at SoCal, like Southern California, SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Uh, and just use the contact form on that side. I receive all the uh, contacts and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, that's it for today. Thanks.